Hi, welcome to Super Awesome Film Club. My name is Adelaide Blair and I will be your host today. This is our 21st episode and tonight we will be talking about Ernst Lubitsch's To Be or Not To Be from 1942. Our panel this week is our usual suspects. We have Io Blair Fries, our movie philosopher. Hi, Io. Hi, everybody. And we have Nick Thacker, our young man about town. Hi, Nick. Hey, yo. Okay, so this is our third cycle or season, however you want to put it. And our theme for this season is what are the movies that made us love movies? What are the things that we've seen that really inspired us to learn more about movies and become more interested in the format. Um, so we're each going to do three movies. Um, I'll go first and my first movie is To Be or Not To Be. Um, it's from 1942, uh, directed by Ernst Lubitsch. It stars Carol Lombard as Maria Tura. It's got Jack Benny as Joseph Tura. Robert Stack as Stanislaw Sobinski. Stanley Ridges as Professor Selitsky and Felix Brissert, I'm not sure how to say that, um, as Greenberg. And we'll, he's not one of the top build guys, but we'll talk about him a little bit later. Um, okay, so normally, well, okay, first I'm going to give the synopsis. And normally the other panelists talk first, but since this is my pick, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how this movie has inspired me. Um, so basically, you have a troupe of Polish actors who are headed by uh, Maria and Joseph Tura, who are sort of hammy, sort of cheesy, um, as uh, I don't want to say many actors are, but as having grown up in a theater town, many actors are. And that is 1939, and they are about to perform an anti-Nazi play called the Gestapo. And the censors are like, no, nah, we can't really do that because we're going to piss off Hitler. And then um, Hitler actually does occupy Warsaw without any warning, in all of Poland, actually. Um, so kind of flash forward a little bit. Uh, Maria Tura has sort of an eye for the gentleman, and her young lover, Sobinski, is in England with a bunch of other Polish airmen, and they are talking to... They are fighting against... Uh, the Nazis, and they are talking to Professor Selinski, who is like, yeah, I'm going to go back to Warsaw on a secret mission. Tell me all your friends and family's names, and then I will tell them that you said hi. So they give them all the information. And then they realize that Selinski is really a Nazi spy, and he's going to go and tell the Nazis all of the personal information of the soldier's family, and so then they're going to kill them, and then the soldiers won't really want to fight anymore. Um, so then uh, Sobinski goes back to Warsaw, and he gets the Turas to help him do this elaborate plot so they can kill Solitsky, and the, things happen. Uh, so this is a fairly traditional thriller, thriller plot, especially, you know, this is uh, took place takes place in 1939 on the eve of World War II. It's before the Americans get involved in the war, and actually production began in this film before the Americans had entered the war, um, although by the time it had finished, they had entered. So it's a pretty standard thriller plot, you know, involving assassination. But, you know, it kind of stars Jack Benny and Carol Lombard, so it's also a comedy. And as such sort of a genre mashup, it was not actually well received by all of the critics, although it was a minor success at the time. Um, and it is crazy funny. Like, it is uh, it is hilariously funny. Like, Jack Benny never really took off in the movies. He was a super popular radio and TV personality. And that's what he was. He was a personality. He wasn't necessarily an actor. And this is the only movie Horrible that really man. captured... <laughs> Horrible. Yeah, he was not a good actor. But... You know, Lubitsch gave him a lot of direction in this film, and it is the only film I feel that really shows Benny as, you know, something other than just a really hysterically funny um, personality. So I personally love this movie, and I have loved it almost my entire life. Oddly enough, when I was five, I did two impersonations. One was of Mae West, and the other one was Jack Benny. Um, <laughs> my family, like my dad was really into like um, 
old radio and TV shows, and I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. And Jack Benini was somebody who, at five, I was very familiar with. And I was, that would have been uh, 1973. So he was still in a lot of, especially a lot of older homes, he was still um, pretty well watched in, in reruns and stuff. And as a kid, I loved this movie because it was really funny because it had Jack Benny in it, who I love. And it also stars Carol Lombard, who, in addition to being like really intelligent and really beautiful, is also has hysterically uh, good timing. And... As a child, I just really, really loved this movie. Although I had no idea what really was going on in it and why it was so funny and why, in fact, as an adult, it would be one of my, in my top five movies of all time. Um, I really, I mean, it's all sex. Like, everything is, including the world, words Heil Hitler is a sexual <laughs> <laughs> innuendo. You know, Carol Lombard uses it as an <laughs> orgasmic cry. By the, um, by the time the evening is over, I'm sure you'll be saying Carl Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just, like, so many great lines. Like, there's the line at the very beginning of the film where they're talking about how Hitler is a vegetarian who doesn't keep to his diet because sometimes he, he swallows whole countries. Um, <laughs> when Sobinski is talking to uh, Maria Tura and he's explaining that he, he's the only man who can drop three tons of dynamite in two minutes, and she very much takes that sexually and um, just kind of runs with it. Uh, and then there's the probably the most controversial line, um, which is what he did to Shakespeare, we are now doing to Poland, uh, which will... I, in the, so if you get a chance and you really like this movie, you should watch the Criterion commentary, um, which I just saw, so if I end up parroting some of that, I'm sorry. But uh, that line is really important, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. But the dialogue, you know, Ernst Lubitsch was just really good about skirting the censors. Um, he was known for making sophisticated movies about sex and through innuendo and glances. And what he didn't show was as important as what he did show in order to convey the meaning of a scene. Um, often that's referred to as the Lubitsch touch. Um, but as an adult and I became more aware of film history and in history in general, I really became amazed at just the pure moxie of the man. Um, you know, just making fun of Nazis while at the same time trying to humanize them a little bit. Like, this is not just a piece of propaganda. This is virulently anti-Nazi. But you know, the Nazis think that they're doing a fine thing, and sometimes they're charming, and but sometimes they're just evil, and evil is couched in the humor when um, there's one cap, there's one character, Earnhardt, who they call me concentration camp Earnhardt, <laughs> and it's just, that's not funny, but it is hysterically funny, um, and just sort of, you know, portraying evil as something that's human, and that reaches all of us and not something that is, they're just these mindless automatons of evil. I, I, I just, and Hitler hated Lubitsch, hated him with a passion. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, turns out he had good reason to, but I'd say that Lubitsch had an equal reason to dislike Hitler, as, you know, pretty much everybody did. <laughs> okay, what did you guys think? Nick? Well... Uh, the first thing that, that really impressed me about this movie was the way in which it revealed the plot, and mostly at the very beginning, um, because there's that whole misdirection at the beginning where the, all these people in the city square are, are looking at this thing, and you, you're not really sure what it is. Um, and you know, It's called To Be or Not To Be, so I was thinking about uh, the apparition of, of Hamlet's father at the beginning of the play, and I, th I thought maybe it's going to be that. And then it's Hitler, what do you know? Um, and it was just this, this act of misdirection, and you, you get the sense that um, that the director has an extreme amount of faith in his audience and, and trusts them that they're going to get this. And a lot of times, um, movies from from that are older date really poorly because you 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 can feel talked down to as as somebody viewing it. And I I never felt that way with this. It just seemed so smart throughout and, and it, it, it expected us to be just as smart as it was. Um, and you know I also thought uh, 
Carol Lombard's character was really interesting in that um, she was able to use her sexuality to her advantage and um, and and kind of like was like entertaining the possibility of this extramarital affair and wasn't shamed over it in any way and it was it was actually a source of comedy for the movie um, and kind of what you're talking about uh, I, I agree with about it 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 being this sort of genre bending beast uh, in in really complex ways and wasn't just anti-Nazi propaganda. It, it was it's a satire, but it's a very smart and textured satire, um, and not escapist in any way. Um, this is this is confronting current events, and um, because this is happening, you know, in the middle of the war, and America wasn't the United States wasn't involved yet, but you know, this is happening three years uh, after the point in time which the film was set. Uh, and it is set up like a traditional thriller, but it, it's confronting current events, and it's not—it's not a means for people going to the cinema to find escape from the world. It confronts it head on, and I just mm -hmm. thought that was uh, really refreshing and, and fabulous. Io, I really liked this movie. At first, I was a little bit afraid because I thought. Hitler, Nazis, comedy, this isn't going to go well for me. Because if there's anything that I hate, it's jokes about like Jews and Nazis and Hitler and concentration camps. I think that it's tacky to make jokes about you know genocide. However, this movie was great. And so, to interrupt for a second, so there were a lot of people at the time who were like freaking out over that exact same thing. Like you know, this isn't funny. You cannot joke about this. This is, you know, genocide. But, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, a lot of people had that first instinct. And a lot of people never overcame it to see um, what this film was really about. Okay, now go. All right. So what I think that the film succeeds at and why I think it succeeds is that it gives not, an, I mean, it's not a historically accurate depiction, but it does target a lot of issues that were happening, um, like, you know, people hiding Jews, it kind of, it, it barely touches on that in a cute kind of way, but it does, you know, address the issue that there were these people who, you know, had to risk their lives in a funny kind of way to, uh, to help out other people, and they have this whole elaborate scheme of, of trying to avoid all the Gestapo and Hitler and this doctor. And I think that it it succeeds because it's campy. Mm -hmm. It succeeds because it does all of these things because they're actors by overacting. Mm -hmm. And it's funny to hear that this guy is known for being a terrible, the main character is known for being a terrible actor because you kind of think that the entire time, but you think he's a terrible actor, or he's a good actor playing a terrible actor. Turns out he's just a terrible actor, but that's why it's funny. Is because you don't you don't take it too seriously because it references itself as being just a movie. It's just mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. It talks about these serious issues, but it is just campy fun. And so it is a good comedy that just happens to also be about Hitler and the Nazis and these really difficult issues. And it has a strong woman character who, yeah, uses her sexuality, which I think is awesome for the 40s. Yeah. And she doesn't get punished at all. I mean, Lubitsch often dealt with sexual matters, but there's no punishment for her. I mean, she's got a new guy by the end of the movie. <laughs> and and uh, she, Carol Lombard is one of my favorite actresses, and I don't know if you know this, but she actually died in a plane crash before this movie was released, oh. um, which was a shame. Uh, because uh, she was known for doing a lot of glamorous roles, but then she got to do a lot of comedy, and uh, she just glows to me. Like, she's just so smart and so funny, and that dress, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that dress is amazing. The costume uh, in this was done really well. Yeah, it is. it is a complete whole perfect piece of art to me. Um, one of the things I love the most is that how they use 
the reputations of the actors in the real life to sort of mirror that in the show. Like Carol Lombard is really, I mean, she's obviously, hopefully, I mean, I didn't know her, but the reputation is, is that she was a very nice, loving person. But she also, you know, was a glamour girl and, uh, you know, very beautiful. And so they kind of take that aspect of her personality and sort of turn it into kind of, she's a little over top with that, wanting her billing and that dress. She wants to wear that dress in a concentration camp scene in their play. Mm -hmm. And then you have Jack Benny. Like, so when he comes out on stage, I don't know if you guys have ever seen any of his comedy. So when he comes out on stage and there's that long pause before he starts to be or not to be, and he just kind of looks at the audience, I crack up every time he does that because that is part of who Jack Benny is as a personality. And in his show, he played somebody who pretended to be a virtuoso uh, violinist but who sucked. <laughs> um, and so that kind of mirrors in this movie where you're sort of laughing. You know, if, you, if you're familiar with these two actors, it sort of um, exemplifies, uh, you know, them but in, you know, a much broader way. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the character of Greenberg, um, who is the only overtly Jewish character. Others in the troupe may be Jewish, but Greenberg, uh, that actor, Felix Resser, uh, worked a lot with Lubitsch and was in a Shop Around the Corner, which was filmed a couple years earlier. And this sort of the, this film is kind of like, Shop Around the Corner Gets Invaded by the Nazis, which I took from the, the Criterion edition. I didn't make that line up uh, in the commentary. I just want to make that clear. But uh, So Greenberg doesn't make it out alive. Um, he dies. And to me, Greenberg is the stand-in. So Lubitsch also was Jewish and, um, and German, and he had left Germany in the 20s to go work in Hollywood. Um, and to me, Greenberg is just a tragic, tragic character. You know, he wants so bad to play Shylock, which is just a horrible, uh, racist, yes. nasty character. But he takes the one part of that role in his lines, um, which he repeats that three times. And do we not bleed? And um, to me, that is so moving. And just you know, and he doesn't he doesn't survive the movie. He sacrifices himself so the others can escape. Um, so I just and I kind of wanted to talk to Io a little bit about what you thought about um, the portrayal of evil in this as being, you know, because it's a it, this this is an assassination plot movie done by people who are kind of vain and silly, but when you compare their petty evil to the broader nastiness of someone like uh, concentration camp Earnhardt. I mean, how did you feel about that portrayal of evil? I did. It was human. They did do, you know, they did a good job. Lubitsch did a good job. Everybody did a good job of being human and making jokes. And you could see, you know, some of the scenes where they had, you know, the actors with the Nazis, they were they were light and funny. And then they were bad. And they and it had the same almost overacting feel, you know, with the bad guys that the good guys had at times. But it was also ugly. Mm -hmm. Like it is tragic that the one truly Jewish character dies. And it that is, I think, this the point at which you kind of feel like, oh yeah, these guys, that isn't really overacting because <laughs> the Nazis were bad. But these are just characters. Mm -hmm. And so it does, you know, there is like a lot of that overacting on both sides. You know, the good guys are overacting good and the bad guys are overacting bad. And I think that the way that they did that made it also, I think... I think I think it's better off that way to have it overacting in that way because you can't really portray true evil like those who commit genocide. Yeah, I think it would be too much. I think it would have been too much. But they did but adding, you know, adding that the tragic scenes and adding the crate just 
some of the craziness of it, um, it it felt it made you feel like, oh yeah, I'm watching a film about Nazis still. Nick, did you have yeah. any last yeah. comments? You know, it, it, it portrayed these evil people as really ridiculous human beings. Um, um, concentration camp, uh, what's his name? Earnhardt. Earnhardt, yeah, that guy in particular, because, you know, there's that one scene where he makes the joke about Hitler um, being turned into a block of cheese or whatever, um, <laughs> and uh, and Tura, like, or uh, Tura's impersonating... Uh, um, Selesky. Yeah, Selesky. And, um, and it's just like, and it's like, dude, like, no, you, you can't say that about Hitler. Like, that's not okay. And then, and then, um, concentration camp dude, uh, freaks out and is like, no, 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 don't tell, don't tell the Fuhrer I said that. Like, don't do that. And it just, it just totally makes this, the, the entire idea of fascism seems so ridiculous. And like, they're just so worried about, Offending this one guy, and everything that they're doing is 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 for the benefit of this one, for the state and this one figure in particular, and it just makes them look completely ridiculous. And I mean, you have to be somewhat of a ridiculous human being to to commit genocide. I think. Well, the guy that the concentration camp Earnhardt was based on, like the real life guy, was like tried at Nuremberg for war crimes. I mean, these right. you know this. So is that supposed to be um, Eichmann? Ah uh, no, I think I forget the name, um, but uh, yeah. So, is it? Does anybody have any? I think it's time for us to wrap this up. And there's so much to talk about in this movie. We could go on forever. Um, is there anything that anybody would like to say before we wrap it up? Watch this movie, and I also watched some selections from the remake as well. Both excellent, excellent films. Okay, I haven't seen the remake, um, the Mel Brooks movie. Yeah, I so I watched like because uh, I, I heard that the ending was different, so I watched it, and it's just as funny. <laughs> yeah, I think Greenberg's ending is different in the Mel Brooks film, although I haven't seen it. Okay, so I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight, and for all of you people watching. We'll be back in two weeks, and we're gonna go with my second pick as uh, of movies that really inspired me as a young person to love movies. And our 22nd episode will be on Local Hero, directed by Bill Forsythe. So thank you. Watch the skies. Watch the skies, everybody. Yeah.